Stand with me, will you please, as we uh, read God's Word. Reading from Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side. And he said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives whom who has sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him. The one who is not against you is for you. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this, your word. Holy, inerrant word sufficient for our hearts, for our lives. And so we pray you'll teach us this morning, Father, from this kind of cryptic passage of Scripture what it is that you want us to learn. Thank you so much for providing for, Lord, our physical needs. And as we, week to week, share from that that you have given us, and we're so grateful for how you have prompted us to give, and so we can carry on the ministry that you've asked us to do here. Lord, very grateful for that. We thank you that you've also provided for our spiritual and emotional needs. And Lord, I'm thinking as we look at that song we just sung about Change My Heart and how in many ways it's a lifetime struggle. And I'm sure there are many this morning, Father, who may be discouraged in some way along the path, wondering exactly where this is all leading Will you please help them not to give up? Help them to continue to look to you and in your time. We pray that you will provide whatever it is that they need in the meantime, Lord. Help us all to realize that your ways are not our ways, but it's only because yours are higher as the heaven is high above the earth. So we trust you. Give us insight again as we look into your word now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated as we look at this passage entitled this sermon, the second in this series, well, Lord, it's hard to be humble, how to be somebody. Well, I want to be somebody. Pastor was going to a leadership conference, and he wanted to have one of his elders go along. And so they went together to this conference where, of course, they, a lot of sharing about things the Lord was doing, and uh, the testimonies tended to be very dramatic, and everybody was wanting to look good. So at one point, someone pulled the pastor aside and asked him, well, how many people attend your church? And he said, oh, we have between eight and 900. His elder was listening to that. He pulled his pastor aside as soon as he got the chance, and he said, Pastor, how can you say that, eight or 900? He said, you know we don't average more than 80 people a week. And the pastor said, yeah, that's between eight and 900. No problem with that, right? We all want to be somebody. And if it takes a little spin doctoring to make it happen, so be it, right? And we're not alone in that. The disciples were of the same mind as we come to this passage of Scripture. You recall that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem in these last sections of the book of Luke. As he travels along, these various things are going on. But with the disciples, their expectation is once they get there, Jesus is going to establish the kingdom, kick the Romans out, put his kingdom together, and they're anticipating what their place is going to be in that kingdom. And so they're in this constant argument about who among them is the greatest. Seems like a strange thing to us, but that's what they were constantly arguing. Look at verse 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest, who's going to be the secretary of war, who's going to be the secretary of state, who's going to occupy what position in this kingdom, who's going to be on the Lord's right hand and who's going to be on his left. That's what they were anticipating. Even up to the night before Jesus was crucified, we're told in Luke 22, verse 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. They were incorrigible on this subject. So Jesus grounds them. 
with this kind of unnerving observation that we find in verse 48. Jesus tells them, for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Now, let's acknowledge and admit right up front, that goes against everything that our world teaches, right? You don't get this at the Harvard Business School. This is not what you're going to learn. You don't get this just in our everyday living, and yet it reflects God's insistence that humility must take the place of pride and human ambition in the kingdom of God. Why is that the case? Well, I think this passage gives us insight into that. So let's take a look, and, and I trust that it will incentivize us to be those who are looking at this from Jesus' perspective. First of all, my humility is the best thing for others. It's the best thing for others. In having this discussion about who was the greatest among them, the disciples were in many ways a product of the society in which they lived. Everyone in that day and time looked up to the Pharisees and the scribes. Those were kind of their heroes. They were the ones they looked to as examples of piety and devotion. And so they were considered kind of at the top of the pinnacle. And what did they see when they looked there? Jesus tells us in Matthew 23, listen to this. Jesus says they do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats at the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. The Pharisees loved attention. They thrived on it. This was their career in many ways. And when the disciples looked at them and saw that they were the people they looked up to, they had the same kind of inclination. They wanted to be somebody. And now, think about the position of the disciples now, having lived most of their lives with the expectation that, hey, maybe there's a Messiah coming someday, and who knows, and these guys are, these Pharisees are gonna be in great shape when this all happens. Now, instead of that being the case, the Messiah has come as far as they're concerned. And they have the inside track. They're the ones that are going with Jesus and ministering around the countryside. They are the ones who are gonna have the inside track in the kingdom. No wonder they're having this argument, right? This is their chance to be somebody. And they're not gonna miss it. They're gonna take the best advantage of this opportunity. Now, we have to ask this question. Is that the right way to benefit other people? Was the pride of the Pharisees helpful to other people? Jesus comments on that as well. In Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus had this comment to make. It's devastating. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter the kingdom yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Let me translate that into modern English. Better you guys had never been born. You know, you're not only headed for hell yourselves, you're taking others with you. Your life is a curse. The life of pride that they lived, thinking only of themselves and how they could elevate themselves in the eyes of people was a curse. Pride always is. Pride says, look at me. Look how spiritually together I am. Look how great I am. Even unconsciously it does that. But is that why we're here? Aren't we here, beloved, to make disciples for Christ, not followers of ourselves? Not here to bring glory to ourselves, but to bring glory to him. We're not to the praise of our own glory, but to the praise of his glory. Imagine, imagine someday finding out that someone missed an eternity with Christ because of the pride that they saw in our lives. They were turned off by it. But that's what the Pharisees were doing, and that's what the disciples at this point in their life are copying. 
thinking if I could just be great in the kingdom, it would be a wonderful thing. They're like the guy who was stopped at a, stopped at a yellow light one day, you know, instead of going through like most of us do, floor it. What, what, wasn't there a movie where this girl asks the alien, what does the yellow light mean? And he says, go faster or something like that. I forgot the movie, should have looked it up. Uh, it was better when you saw it in person. <laughs> we usually floor it to get through those, right? But this guy stopped. So the lady behind him was, was I mean, she was ticked off. She had to screech to a halt. She lost her makeup falling all over the floor. She was honking her horn in the middle of a big rant when the policeman knocked on the side of her window, right? And he talked to her for a little bit. She protested her innocence, and so he took her in. Well, a couple hours later, they were releasing her. So they brought her out from the jail, brought her out to the front, and the guy that had arrest, arrested her was there waiting. He said, I, lady, I, I want to apologize to you. I, I'm so sorry. He said, but when I saw you flipping that guy off and, and, and you were swearing a blue streak and honking your horn and going through all these gyrations, he said, and then I saw in the back end of your car, I saw that sticker that said, what would Jesus do? And I saw that, I saw that license plate thing that said, choose life. And I saw the chrome-plated fish that you had on the back of the car indicating Christianity. I just thought you stole the car. <laughs> you can't blame me. Listen, the only reason you laugh is because you know it could happen to you, right? That's why. We could all be guilty. But how devastating it would be to find out that because we lived as though this life was all about us and not about someone else, that someone missed the glory of God. We, we don't want to be there, do we? But Jesus says that's, that's where you're headed. So our humility is, is, is good for others. It's good for others who don't know Christ. It's good for others who do know Christ. It's good for other believers. Humility is the thing that sort of lets us hang together. Pride devastates the body of Christ, right? Why are we here? We're here, the Bible teaches us, to edify and to build each other up. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, he says that we've all been given a manifestation of the Spirit, a spiritual gift, essentially. Why? To show off? No, he says, you've been given that for the common good. You've been, give, you've been gifted. You've been gifted to help each other. You've been gifted to, in some way, build each other up. It's hard to do that if you're just in the process of defending some position that you have or you're, you're in the process of lording it over others because you know better how certain things should be done or how the process should be accomplished. And you've got yourself vested in this, and so you're going to stand for that no matter what. And, you know, Paul reminds us just a little bit later after that verse. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2, he says, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. What he's saying is you may be the most superior person around. You may be the one who knows best. You may be the one who has an inside track on all the knowledge that should be done in order to accomplish a successful ministry. But if you're not acting in a loving manner toward those who are around you, you are useless. Do you ever notice how certain things go together? Thunder and lightning, right? Cities and streets, tennis and rackets. My personal favorite, Dave and Patty, you know? <laughs> Certain things, I'll probably get some for that. I don't know, it's worth a point, I think. Well, certain things go together. Did, did, you know, did you know that pride has a partner? Pride has a partner. Pride's partner is identified for us in Proverbs 28, verse 25, where God says a greedy man, and, and literally the word there is a broad soul. Most of the, most of the, English translates and trans, translated an arrogant man. An arrogant man stirs up strife. An arrogant man stirs up strife, but the one who trusts 
in the Lord will be enriched. Think about what that means. You've got the inside track on all knowledge, and you know that certain things should be done certain ways. And in your arrogance, you want to get that across. It's very important to do that. But the Lord says, if you do that in a proud way, all you do is create strife. You don't create a solution, you create strife. But if you'll trust in the Lord, in other words, if you just leave that thing in his hands, you will be enriched. If you want strife in your life, keep pride there. The two go together. That's why the Lord urges in Philippians 2, 3, don't do anything, even if it's right. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humiliation, count others more significant than yourselves. Is that hard? Absolutely. But beloved, isn't this the way we put the gospel into practice? By doing humility for the sake of others instead of doing pride for the sake of ourselves? The disciples were certainly not edifying each other in their ongoing discussion about who among them was the greatest, were they? Not by any stretch of the imagination. Pride led to strife and bitterness. And it'll do the same for us. God, listen, please listen to this carefully. God would rather that you be wronged than that you exercise pride. And he'll take, he'll take care of the wrong. Second reason for humility, my humility is the best thing for myself. My humility is the best thing for myself. Jesus challenges his disciples' juvenile behavior here in two ways. First of all, he reminds them that humility, not pride, is the pathway to God. And secondly, he reminds them that humility, not pride, is the pathway to greatness. We see the first one, the pathway to God in verse 48. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. You know, to understand Jesus' actions on this occasion, you have to understand that children were not the you know, precious center of attention in that society that they are today. They were ill thought of. They were an inconvenience. Among adult crowds, they were to be seen and not heard. And that's why in Matthew 19, when people are bringing children to, the, to Jesus to be healed, the disciples are turning them away. Said, we don't want anything to do with these kids. Get them out of here. And so Jesus takes a child. It's a good day for you to be here, Serena, apparently takes a child, and he sits them in the midst, right? And he says, guys, here's the deal. How you treat this child is how you treat me. And how you treat me is how you treat the father. If you can't accept this child, you can't be accepted by God. And if you can't accept each other, you can't be accepted by God. It's just that simple. You can't, listen, think of it this way. You can't harm the family and be right with the father. The fellow believer that you can't stand, guess what? God loves them passionately. If they're wrong, God will discipline them. That's why God says, leave the vengeance to me. If they're wrong, God will discipline. What about us? What's our job? Love them to death. He says, love your enemies. You got it in for somebody? You need to find a way to go wrap your arms around them and say, I care about you. These are practical, just practical applications, beloved, that show we're living in humility instead of pride. President Truman picked up his newspaper, December 6, 1950, and he read a review 
that a guy named Paul Hume, a critic for the Washington Post, had written about his daughter. His daughter had done a concert, a singing concert the night before, Margaret. And Paul Hume said, well, she was very attractive, but he said she's really not a very good singer and she, she really hasn't improved very much <laughs> over the years. It wasn't really a scathing review, it just wasn't exceptionally positive. But Truman took it very personally. He wrote back, Mr. Hume, no dear, please notice. I have just read your lousy review of Margaret's concert. I've come to the conclusion that you are an eight ulcer man on four ulcer pay. It seems to me that you are a frustrated old man who wishes he could have been successful. When you write such poppycock as was in the back section of the paper, you, 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 your work for it shows conclusively that you're off the beam and at least four of your ulcers are at work. Someday I hope to meet you. When that happens, you'll need a new nose, a lot of beefsteak for black eyes, and perhaps a supporter below. Harry didn't mince too many words. I don't think he could do this anymore, but he did. And then he says this, Pegler, who was, a, who was kind of a known gutter snipe in those days, he says, Pegler is a gentleman alongside you. I hope you'll accept that statement as a worse insult than a reflection on your ancestry, HST. Harry S. Truman. You can't bluff it. Hate the children and be acceptable to the Father. You can't exercise pride toward God's children, toward our fellow believers, and be right with the Father. It's not possible. Sometimes I wonder if God wouldn't write us a letter like this sometimes, if he were still in the letter writing business at the moment. Humility is the pathway to God. Secondly, humility is the pathway to greatness. Humility is a pathway to greatness. Some of you have probably read about this, but at the age of 31, Abraham Lincoln was in such a depression that his friends actually removed all sharp objects and, razor, uh, and, and razors from his room for fear that he would take his own life. His best friend at the time was a man named Joshua Speed, and Speed told him, Lincoln, if you don't rally, you're going to die. And Lincoln said to him at that time, he said, well, listen, I'd, I'd be happy to die, except I haven't done anything to make any human being remember that I ever lived. And if you've read anything about Lincoln, you know that in the midst of his humility, there was a burning ambition, the passion to be somebody drove Lincoln. But Lincoln wasn't unique in that, right? We're all driven by the desire to be somebody. We want to be remembered. We don't want to get the end of life and think, wow, it was useless. And do anything meaningful. We want to be somebody. It's what drove the disciples to have this ongoing discussion about who was the greatest. In a sense, you can say God's put that desire in us, that desire for immortality, the disciples were really pursuing a good end, a legitimate desire, but they were doing it by illegitimate means, right? So what's the answer? If they, were, if they were doing it wrongly, what's the answer? How do we do it rightly? I can tell you this, no one in our culture or in that culture at that time would have ever come up with the solution that Jesus did, right? Never. But Jesus said, for he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Really? I mean, that's not the world we live in, right? That's not what we experience on a daily basis. No one says the janitor is more important or greater or more to be admired than the CEO. They don't even know his name. But see, that's exactly the point, isn't it? Jesus isn't speaking from the standpoint of this world. He's speaking from a heavenly perspective. And there, greatness isn't measured by who can make the biggest splash. Greatness is measured by who can give the most. Greatness is measured by 
who can give the most. When we join the kingdom of God, and I saw most of you raise your hands this morning and say, yeah, I accepted Jesus somewhere along the line. That means you've joined the kingdom of God if your decision was heartfelt and real. But when we join the kingdom of God, beloved, we're committed to a whole different set of dynamics and values than we were before. And those, are play, those play out in the life of Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate expression of those values. So let me ask the question this morning, where do we most see the greatness of Jesus? Is it, is it in the miracles that he does? Was it on the day when he stood there and said, Lazarus, come forth, and here comes Lazarus, a dead man out of the four days out of the tomb? Was that where his greatness was most displayed? How about that passage in Revelation 19 that describes his second coming and how he's going to come on this glory and power on this white horse and he's, he's going to have the diadems of the king of kings on his head and he's going to have eyes of flaming fire and he's going to have a, out of his mouth is going to come this sword that represents the word of God by which he's going to wipe out all the sin and evil and everything else by just the word of his mouth and set up the kingdom of, of eternal light and, and goodness. Is that where his glory and greatness will be most displayed? The Bible's answer is no. That's not the place. The greatness of Jesus, beloved, was most displayed on the cross. Didn't look like it from a human standpoint, right? There he was, hanging between heaven and earth, helpless from a human perspective, naked before a mocking world. He didn't look great. But see, underneath all of that, what was happening? He was taking on himself the penalty for the sin of every person who would ever commit their life to him. In the eyes of God, there was no greater moment in the life of Christ than that moment. That's why Paul says later on, on the basis of his humiliating death, the Father highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will one day bow and every tongue will one day confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The cross is what triggered all of that. It's the greatest act of service and humility that's ever been rendered in this universe. Without it, we would all be lost, without hope. What a great thing Jesus did and the greatness that he did there measured only in terms of what we give, not in terms of what we get, was displayed by Jesus in a crowning fashion on that cross. Jesus who said, he who is least among you is the one who is great, practiced it, showed us how to do it. If he had stood up for his rights, if he had insisted upon his reputation, if he had said, these are my riches and I'm going to hang on to them, he'd have never gone to the cross. Think about that. Because those are the things that keep us exercising pride instead of humility. Jesus' greatness is most demonstrated at the cross. So the question this morning is, how least are we? How least are we? It's not exactly our style, is it? It's not exactly where we tend to go. We don't typically sit down at the beginning of the day and say, how can I be least today? How can I serve today? How can I be the one who is not thought of in the eyes of man because I'm doing something that will be great in the eyes of God? We don't do this. Our world does not honor little people. But let me tell you something, God does. And at the end of the day, his opinion is gonna be the only one that counts, right? It's the only one that counts. I saw this modeled in a wonderful way when we moved from Kansas to California when I was 18. We began to, to attend Magnolia Church. And for the First time in my young life, I saw some pastors that I could really look up to, some men of God 
who, who were tremendous men of the word, and they also played baseball and basketball and all that kind of stuff. Loved those guys. Pastor Ken is one of the reasons that we're here today. He's one of, the, one of the reasons we're here today because of what he taught me back then and because of the last year of his life, the year before we came here, he had a tremendous influence in what Patty and I were going to do next. He and his brother, Pastor Lauren, were wonderful men. They were honored in this life and got acclaim, although they were humble servants even here. But there was another man in that church, Paul, Paul Leuschner, the janitor. I hadn't thought of Paul for years until I was putting this sermon together. Paul's brother was a great evangelist known all over the country. But Paul had none of those skills of communication. In fact, you could hardly get a word out of Paul most of the time. But for years, Magnolia Church was the most spotlessly clean, well-maintained church in all of Orange County, California because of Paul Leuschner. Paul lived right next door to the church. He was over there night and day making sure that it was ship shape and that everything was in great shape for the, next, for the next occasion. He knew his gifts and he faithfully used them, sometimes very sacrificially. Paul was one of the ones who was least. But I absolutely expect one day to see Paul standing right up there beside Pastor Ken and Pastor Lauren, receiving from the Lord the highest honors, which I know he will then cast at the feet of Jesus. Because that's the kind of guy he is. But let me tell you, beloved, if you want to be great in the eyes of God, you have to go in through the servant's entrance. You can't go in through the front door. It's just a question of whether we want to be great. Humility is the only pathway to greatness. There isn't any other one. If you want to know how you rate in heaven, ask yourself, who have I been serving lately? Finally, my humility is the best thing for God. It's the best thing for God. Proverbs 16, 5 tells us everyone who is arrogant in heart, you don't even have to be it outwardly. If you're arrogant in heart, the way you tell that is if when you're watching a football game, you know every move they should have made and didn't. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Do you, you see what I mean? We're, just, we're always looking at somebody else and we know, you can tell I know what I talk about, right? Because I'm there. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. That's, that's not the end of the verse. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Pride touches the glory of God. And you can't do that without risk. The disciples were not there to steal the glory of God. They were there to reflect the glory of God, just like we are. And when they're having this discussion on the way to Jerusalem and their whole thought is how great they're gonna be in the kingdom, their mind is about as far removed and divorced from the mind of God as it could possibly be. They're out of touch with reality. They're living in fantasy land, like we are when we think we're great. The arrogance shows up in verse 49. Look at it. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he does not follow us. Imagine John. I mean, he's, can't you see him? He's thoroughly puffed up in his own mind and heart, right? Jesus, guess what we did? There's some guy out there casting out demons in your name and he's not one of us. We put a stop to that. Nobody's going to cast out demons unless it's under your authority, and we're the ones that are going to make sure that's the way it happens. Is he helping? He's thwarting the will of God, isn't he? If 
Demons were going to be cast out in Jesus' name. God's work is being done. John's pride is now hindering that work. And that's why Jesus tells him, don't stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. In other words, get some humility, John. You're not, you're not the one who's looking out for my back. I can do that just fine on my own. He may not be doing it the same way. He may not have the same manner. He may not think the same way. His creed may not be like yours exactly. He may have some differences in his theology, but if he is preaching the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, whatever the differences are, we can live with. We don't have we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't have all the truth in our own, you know, we, we, we don't have a monopoly on truth, right? That's why Augustine said it this way. He said, in essentials, unity. We stand for those. There are certain things, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the death of Christ, the deity of Christ. There are certain things. You don't give on those. The Bible's very clear. In essentials, unity in doubtful matters, liberty, in all things, charity, which in his language was love. This is in the humble nature of our Lord and it reflects his glory. So would you say that humility is worth pursuing if you want to be somebody? It's best for others, it's best for us, it's best for our Lord. Jesus gave radical advice. He who is least among you is the one who is great. The recruiting sergeant was addressing his new recruitment class one day. He said, anybody here have any experience with radio communications? One of these guys was a, an experienced ham radio operator, so he's real quick to raise his hand. Anybody who'd been in the service never would have done that, right? But he raised his hand and he said, yeah, I've got experience. The, Sergeant looked at him, he said, good, you can go dig the hole for the new telephone pole we got. <laughs> How do you spot greatness? You spot it by whether he went willingly and enthusiastically and dug the hole, right? That's how you spot greatness. Let's be great, beloved. Let's serve each other for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. It's kind of one almost in passing. Probably not the first one we would ever think of, and yet there's such a powerful message there, such an inducement to make sure that the attitudes of our hearts and minds are truly in submission to you, looking out for your glory and not for our own. So, Lord, would you help us to be that kind of people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.